Uh, thanks, uh, Jim. And thanks, Heather, for uh, for having me. Um, I finally can, right? That's one of the benefits of the the Twitter storm. I won't spend any time uh, any time on. So please don't ask any questions. It's in the works and stuff. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's great to be here. Um, and uh, I've talked about uh, event Wi-Fi in two thousand and seventeen at the WLPC in uh, in Lisbon. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is a, a new generation of, of, of events. And, and so it was due for an update. And, and so, uh, I, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, let me try and shed some light on event Wi-Fi. Um, so I, I made up a, um, a little uh, agenda. So for those of you who, who don't know me i'll just do a quick introduction and then we'll talk about the stages in which we uh, we we rolled out or completed the event so looking at preparations looking at the actual roll rollout some validation uh, of course events always mean last minute changes some incidents that happened um and and then when the event went live and and so in the end the, the tear down and then you can guys can shoot some questions if you want to if it's something that really feel free to ask and, and try and interrupt uh, it, if you see any uh, really interesting questions, uh, Jim, Heather, I'm guessing you guys monitor that. So feel free to um, to to barge in and, and try do. and make this uh, interactive as possible. Um, so just a little bit, teeny bit about me, uh, Raymond Hendricks. Um, and, and yes, Hendricks is spelled with I-X. And, and I saw the little chat with Anders. No, it's not Jimmy. Uh, sorry, sorry, Anders. Uh, I I don't have any sense of rhythm. I even whistle off key, so no relation, whatever. Uh, but it is spelled the same last name, Hendrix. Um, uh, but in the Netherlands, Hendrix gets spelled in like seven different uh, uh, different ways, and I find myself getting old because I used to say, "Well, right, Hendrix, just like Jimmy." And now young people look at me, Jimmy, who? Oh. Um, so yeah. Um, I am the, um, the, the, the owner and, and founder of Wi-Fi Wise International, um, and um, it is founded as a company that focuses on Wi-Fi, just layer one, layer two, occasionally a little bit layer three, but we focus on, on, on the Wi-Fi part. We try to stay clear of switches, so we, we love our RF, and so that's probably a great match with, uh, with 7Signal as well. Um, I am uh, also a CWNE, um, so do these count as for my credits as well, presenting here? I guess. Um, but uh, um, I'm a CWNE and also a certified uh, trainer as well, um, and been doing Wi-Fi for, for 15 plus years, and in a whole bunch of different verticals from offices to warehouses to uh, um, healthcare, hospitals, uh, elderly care, you name it, I I've been in those environments. Um, and, and so we've done designs, troubleshooting, and, and, and other stuff in there as well. So that's, uh, that's what we, we try to focus on with, uh, with Wi-Fi Wise. Uh, you, you can follow me on Twitter, Raymond Hendricks. There are some interesting discussions going on at the moment. Um, and you can also find uh, more detailed information about what we do on our website, which is wifiwise.com. But yeah, enough about me. Uh, let's talk about um, event Wi-Fi. So um, event Wi-Fi is um, different from other Wi-Fi as in regards that all the uh, um, normal planning that you do goes out the window. Uh, you need to be very flexible. It is a highly changing environment. So um, with this presentation, I'm trying to walk you through a, a time period before the event, until the event, and then even after the event. So you guys can have an idea of what it means to do event Wi-Fi. So um, it, uh, it starts with a, getting a call saying, well, hey, um, you do Wi-Fi, right? C can you do Wi-Fi for us? And I've done the Formula One last year. So this year was, yeah, I got a call. Um, and so the the TTR, the time till race, is about 90 days. 
and then you get a call saying, hey, can, can you do the Wi-Fi for us again? And yeah, sure. Kind of counted on it. They, they mentioned it last year saying, oh, well, we'll do this again next year. But you never know until you get the call. So uh, yeah, he said, can you do it again? Same as last year. Sure, we can do it again. Same, yeah. So can, can you give me some, uh, some information again? Uh, so like we, we all want to know when, uh, when we were developing Wi-Fi is okay. What, what kind of clients do we do I need to support on that, um, on that environment? And, and so again, yeah, same as last year. So, okay, looking at same as last year. So they, uh, they used iPads for payment. So that is a controlled group of clients. Then um, the, the local organizer committee is, is basically hired self-employed that make up a brand, make up a local organizing committee, lots of self-employed people. So they all bring their own gear. So there's a lot of bring your own device for the local organizing committee. There's also all the construction crew that start way before even the event starts because tents have to be built. Uh, temporary seating has to be built, VIP uh, tents need to be built, you name it. They, they even build, the, I think it was the largest Ferris wheel in, in Europe, just temporarily at that location. Um, so everything needs Wi-Fi. And one of the, uh, the, the critical parts is BYOD for the press. Because, well, if it doesn't work, you'll get bad press. And, and who wants bad press, right? So bad press is never good. Um, so from, from these clients, you, you, you okay, well, whenever we design Wi-Fi, we learn, okay, we need to uh, try and determine, okay, what is our LCMI, our least capable, most important device? Um, so um, in, in, in this environment, um, the, uh, the iPads were, were deemed the, uh, the LCMI. And and so maybe somebody has an idea on on why iPads. Maybe people can put that in chat as the LCMI. Yeah, that's a good question. Usually two spatial streams, five gigahertz support. Really not too bad of a client usually. S Samad says. Uh, <laughs> I'll paraphrase. They are poor at roaming. Okay. I've got a couple talking about the money. <laughs> they want the money. <laughs> exactly. So we had over almost a thousand iPads and they were used for payments. They were used as payment terminals. So yeah, it's all about Dooku, all about the money. Oh, More about it? that the MI part of LCMI, the most important clients. Yeah, <laughs> and that was deemed the very most important client. And so, yeah, uh, um, we had the press show up with uh, with with some somebody showed up with a um, an XP laptop still. Um, yeah, so you you try to accommodate as best as possible. We, we've seen Windows Seven laptops as well. Um, so you, you kind of get these old things that you have to get online. So clients, we, we have a good view of clients. Um, so, okay, I, I need to know where to build Wi-Fi. So you go, okay, where do you want Wi-Fi? Do you have a map for me? Um, so moving on, time goes forward because you can ask the question. That doesn't mean you will receive a map. Um, and so. You'll, you'll probably ask again. So um, can I have a map, please? And, and so now we're at, at 60 days into the event. I was like, yeah, well, the track probably hasn't changed. So seating probably will be a lot like last year. So we started some preliminary planning based on, on last year's map. So we can at least know, okay, and, and determine not just Wi-Fi, but also cable routes. We need to know where to run cable. And, and I know everybody's heard the joke that, well, it's wireless, right? Why do you need cables? Well, yeah, we still need cables to run Wi-Fi. Um, and, and no mesh is not Wi-Fi, um, at least not in my opinion. 
Um, so we started some, uh, some preliminary planning based on, on last year's map. And then you work a little bit uh, still. Um, and, and then we, uh, we say, okay, well, we're, we're 30 days in. Um, so crews are already going on site and they're already building tents. And so that goes way before the events are. They, they start building temporary structures and that kind of thing. So like, um, can I have a map pretty please? Um, so we need to have um, crews on site that run, install and, and deploy our backbones. So uh, um, I was hired by a company called Riedel. Uh, Riedel. Um, it's a, a, a well, origin German company um, that do a lot of audio video uh, networks for um, very large events, a lot of audio video uh, um, customers. They do, uh, they've done things for Olympics. So it's, it's a big player. They also do, um, with the, uh, the traveling circus that is the Formula One, they also travel and do all the uh, um, two-way radio communication for all the teams. They also do a lot of data for, for several teams. Um, so it, it's a well-known and, and big company, and, and they asked me to do the Wi-Fi. So um, what they've done uh, and what, what uh, uh, Riedel has developed is a, a, a network called MeteorNet. And MeteorNet is a, um, well, I tried to figure out okay, how, how do I describe MeteorNet? And so the best description I came up with is it's a redundant, self-healing, fiber-based mesh network for audio, video, and data. It, it's, um, they, they, they use several different fiber pairs. They can combine fiber pairs. They can color fiber pairs um, and, and therefore layer data. They have impeccable uh, timing protocols on there as well. So, so audio and video comes into sync. Um, and, and then for us, interesting is they can also run data over there. So what they've done as a basis for our Wi-Fi, they installed MeteorNet. Um, so that was installed over the Formula One track. And, and this is a, a Google Maps picture of the F1 track um, when there is no F1. So you, you can see the, the, the track here. And um, um, this little area here is where the paddocks are. So it's, a, it's, it's pretty small. And so finally, you, you get a, a map, and then you can see, ah, OK, well, this is the same track. And, and this is the same paddock area. But all the way here and here, and over here, all these blue uh, uh, squares is where they've built temporary seating. So they've built scaffolding with temporary seating for over 70,000 people. So go back again, empty track, have one track. That's amazing. So it, it's, They've built so much, and it's all scaffolding, so it's all iron. And, and then it's like, oh, could you do Wi-Fi in these spots? And so then the yellow here and here is for VIPs and press. So these are VIP tents over here. This is where the press is, and on top of that press is also the uh, uh, the, the F1 paddock club. Um, the, the green ones also very important because this is where the entrances are to the track. So they need to scan barcodes to see if you can enter the track. And, and all the blue is where you'd have production network, but also for payments um, and, uh, and uh, for, for selling uh, uh, drinks and snacks, but also where you can buy these ridiculously overpriced uh, uh, t-shirts and hats and that kind of thing. Um, so this is where all the payment network had to be installed as well. 
and so once we had the uh, the, the the map and and we, we could try and build that uh, that fiber backbone which is a, a meteor net and um, we rolled out 50 kilometers of temporary fiber so that's probably about 35 miles ish of, of just temporary fiber we we deployed just so we can do Wi-Fi as well, over a hundred switches. Uh, Riedel is a HPE partner, so um, Aruba uh, HPE Aruba is the go-to Wi-Fi solution. So we use 128 Aruba APs, indoor, outdoor, uh, Wi-Fi five, Wi-Fi six, all of mix. We used two controllers in a high availability, high availability solution. Um, and we um, we used four high availability high availability sets of forty eight firewalls, all using different uplinks. So we could separate data for the different client groups that were on on the track. And yeah, yeah, I'm still talking about Wi-Fi, but. We still need to lay the groundworks before we can do Wi-Fi. And MeteorNet looks like this when you look at their um, um, and at their uh, monitoring console. And so you can see every hub has multiple links to it. Um, and so these are all stations that receive data, receive audio, receive video, um, and also a lot of endpoint switches where we based our Wi-Fi on. So then the crews could uh, go and install um, install the uh, the Wi-Fi uh, APs on spots that uh, that I uh, I came up with, and what I did I'll quickly go back to um, this uh, this slide. I kind of did a inverted design because when you look at a um, a bar, a bar is located under a stand, but it's just a tiny pop-up tent under this massive amount of scaffolding. But the problem I have, the attenuation I have, is not from the scaffolding. That will reflect like hell, and it's open anyway. The problem I have is humans. Wouldn't Wi-Fi be great without humans? <laughs> but yeah, so I, I kind of did an aver inverted design. Um, using Akahau and, and just saying, well, this is area where there's a lot of people. And then say, well, if I place APs here and here and here. So that's how we, we eventually ended up doing our, our design. Not so, using materials attenuation, but using users. Question that came up in the chat. How, how, how much attenuation do you estimate from a, a crowd like that in those stands? I, uh, I, I kind of upgraded the... Um, uh, uh, the 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 default echo. I think the echo says default is one and a half dBs of attenuation per per meter. If you use attenuation areas, um, and it's always yeah, it depends on on the person. I'm i myself. I'm I'm like I, I, I at least I think I'm in shape. So I'm probably a one and a half dB person. But maybe another guy is not so in shape as I am, and maybe is a two or three dB person. Um, but I, I, I'd rather be safe than sorry. So I use two and a half dBs as attenuation for per meter for the crowd because it's a dense crowd. There's a hundred thousand people coming there every single day. Um, so MeteorNet um, was rolled out. APs were were hung, installed in places where I said, please install them. Um, and and so then uh, when the Wi-Fi was rolled out, well, I need to think of, well, there's a hundred thousand visitors. So that means there's a hundred thousand, at least a hundred thousand devices probing, hey, Wi-Fi, are you there? Hey, home router, are you there? And I don't want my my APs to um to reply to that. Um so one of the things is okay, well, we're not going to use 2.4 at all. We didn't deploy 2.4 anywhere. Um, we had to design a, a, a network for the LCMI. Again, all about the money. So speed, 
we didn't care that much about speed. Well, maybe in the press area because press wants their articles up, but in, in all the bar areas, all the sales areas, I needed a reliable network um, because they want to make money. They want to sell their drinks. And um, if they can't sell drinks and people need to wait and think at the bar, oh, hang on, payment isn't going through. And there's like a whole bunch of people waiting, then things will get ugly. So payment was really critical. Uh, we monitored the, pay the payment network nonstop and and we also monitored the uh, the endpoint for all the payments nonstop seeing okay are we still okay on our network are we still okay on our firewall so we, we monitored everything and, and and then it's okay let's build the ssids well of course i think i had a list of 14 ssids that they wanted and, and we all know like well hang on we don't want to do that many ssids so um, what we came up with, with areas of where do you want which SSID? And so the area where the bars were, we had our management and our, our payment and our production network. So we were able to reduce the areas to a maximum of four SSIDs in a certain area to make sure that we don't overflow the network with all these broadcasts. And then we said, well, okay, um, we, we can't use um, channels 100 to 116. These were reserved and blocked for the FOM, the Formula One management, which controls the Formula One. And, and they said, well, in, in the bid book, so it stated you can't use these channels. We had to tell the track that, hey, hang on, you guys are still using these channels. Please swap those channels as well so we weren't allowed to use any of those uh, those channels all the others were were okay and um, so we chose to use 20 megahertz channel we wanted to build a reliable network with channel reuse and again we're doing payments that's our main thing that we're doing in in the most areas so 20 megahertz is just fine we don't need massive data we need a stable network. So that's what we do used, 20 megahertz. And um, I've used 80 megahertz for, for the press area. Um, and, and the press area was in the center. There weren't any payment terminals nearby. So that worked out just fine. Then uh, we did a design and, and we, we played around with transmit power. So within the Aruba controllers, we, we had to adjust the uh, ARM settings. So it matches the transmit power that we used in our design. And then we said, well, I don't want any APs offering low data rates. Again, we want that, that network to be stable and reliable. So we said, well, the minimum data rate needs to be bigger than 18 megabits per second. And again, we have these 100,000 devices probing, hey, Wi-Fi, are you out there? And also doing these wildcard probe requesting anybody, is there any Wi-Fi out there? And we didn't want to respond to that. So we said, okay, we're not going to respond to any wildcard probe responses. We uh, we disabled uh, multi-user MIMO because multi-user MIMO, high-density environment, not going to work. I'm, I'm curious if any of the um, uh, uh, attendees, have you ever seen MIMO work? Have you ever seen it work without a lot of overhead as well? Let us know. Yeah, but does it chat. give you the benefit they say it will? Right. So yeah. we, uh, we we disabled the uh, the multi user MIMO, um, and um, what I did is I enabled the uh, the AP names to be broadcasters in the uh, in the beacon. Because if I see that, then it makes it so much easier to say what AP am I connected to. It's so much easier for troubleshooting to see the AP name as well. So uh, now looking at and installing and configuring this Wi-Fi, this is, I was on site uh, a week before uh, the event. So time to race is now seven days, even less when tweaking and putting up the late last APs. So um, 
everything in order. We're pro- roughly in, uh, in, in, in two, three days until the event. So then I'm running around like a headless chicken saying, okay, do we have Wi-Fi in all areas? Are all the SSIDs where I want them to be? So I'm, I'm checking for signal. I'm, I'm logging on to each and every SSID in each and every location to make sure that everything is working. Because what happened is I was trying to connect and then you can see this, well, hang on. And, and so this is a, a, a NetAlly uh, Etherscope XNG. You can do uh, uh, on the spot testing with it. And it shows me which AP am I, I'm connected to. It shows me the channel and, and see, see the DHCP. It, it tried for 60 seconds, didn't work. So problem here isn't Wi-Fi. The, the, the RF is great. The problem is I'm not getting an IP address. And we're running out that many APs, that many switches. In this case, problem is, well, I'm, I'm not in the correct VLAN. The, not all ports had the correct VLAN tagged. So easy fix. Call up the guys on the radio, say, hey, please check and do it again. And then you'll see, hey, I'm connected. And so I've done that for almost 120 plus APs, checking so do I have a connection? Are all the SSIDs there? And and sometimes you even find that, well, hey, hang on, I'm, I'm getting a duplicate IP address. So a lot of times what we're, what we're trying to do is, or at least what I'm trying to do is I bring all these tools so I can see, well, I've, I've designed Wi-Fi. The problem you're having is not a Wi-Fi issue. So please don't blame the Wi-Fi. That's what I always try to do. So you, you've installed Wi-Fi, you've configured Wi-Fi, you've checked the Wi-Fi, and then, yeah, it, it wouldn't be an event if there weren't any last-minute changes. And so I got the request saying, well, hey, can you do, um, can you do Wi-Fi, same as last year? Um, and, and so things change. And they forgot to mention, well, last year was still in COVID, so they had less visitors but also less press. So um, now press went from 150, 160 press people to over 400. Um, so we only, all of a sudden we had 300 peoples of press. And so, yeah, my density Wi-Fi in the press area also all of a sudden became a very high density area of Wi-Fi in the press. So yeah, how do you fix that? So you try and we only add Omni AP. So you try and, and place them in certain areas so you can uh, you can make sure that they choose a small cell and make it work like that. But it's not just the Wi-Fi that suffered from here because you need to have power for those people as well. So we had to roll in all these power sockets and make sure that everybody had power as well or else things wouldn't work. And and there were some other areas as well that came clear and clear where they said, well, this this all of a sudden became a, um, a bar area or this all of a sudden became a shop area. And so you, know, you just adapt and build on, make sure that the Wi-Fi is, is, is up and running. Um, so as you're building and as you're, you're getting to that event, you build a stable network, but then uh, you work. So what I did is I, we, we came in around 8 in the morning, 8 a.m., and, and there were evenings where I left at 1 a.m. Um, and, and then, again, the alarm clock went off at 6 a.m. again. So... Um, it's not a standard office day. Um, and so you build things until 1 a.m. And then in the morning, you come and you look at your uh, Meteor net and you can see, well, there's a whole bunch of APs down and, and switches down. And, and then they said, well, uh, things happen. Incidents happen. And, and one of the incidents that happened was we got a call saying, well, a lot of things went down because somebody was... Uh, cleaning up the track, running down with a weed cutter, and 
Yeah. So this is weed cutter versus uh, fiber. And guess what? The weed cutter wins. And you get these calls and well, hey, all of a sudden, um, 300 payment terminals are down. Uh, this was pre-event. So, but still it's like, oh, hang on. So it has quite a big impact. Um, another incident that happened is uh, in the middle of the night, um, these uh, Dixie toilets needed to be uh, filled before the event started. And if you have these big lorries that, uh, um, or big trucks that go over a, a temporary uh, culvert to, that you use to run the fiber through, the, the culvert breaks and, and also the fiber breaks. Again, resulting in, well, hey, the Wi-Fi isn't working. Yeah, it's, it's not a Wi-Fi issue. We, we had an incident which was a, 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 a Wi-Fi issue. Um, and again, it was a truck in the evening coming by. And uh, it ran into a AP. So, yeah, what we also do is we do um, AP first aid. Let me. I thought I had the, the animation down in this uh, in this PowerPoint, but for some reason it's not. There we go. So zip ties. As an event, with an event, you 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 carry a lot of zip ties and a lot of uh, gaffer tape. Um, so at the at, at the moment you're at uh, T minus uh, zero days for uh, for the event time to race zero days. Um, we think we have all the kinks out, and uh, that's when we uh, we we, we uh, sit back and relax and uh, just monitor the network. We um, um, we we do have the um, benefit of having a, uh, a accreditation, so we um, we can go on the track or, or at least almost on the track track side and say, well, hey, take some nice pictures so you, we we can see this is uh, the F one car of Max, and so we can we can monitor network, we can walk around, watch the race. And uh, of course, we uh, we can enjoy the results, especially when a uh, a Dutch driver wins, right? It was a, a a nice, yeah. He won last year, and so it's a big fest after he won this year. Um, and I'm not sure. Did you guys catch uh, catch the news of uh, the? Um, I think it was the qualifiers that were delayed because. Um, uh, some and, and yes, that's also a Dutch guy, an orange or a Max fan. But he threw these orange flares on the track, these smoke grenades. Um, so the um, um, the uh, uh, the event was or the, the qualifying was was temporarily halted, and so it had to be cleaned up. Um, but yeah, we we also had almost a such a almost incident. This is uh, one of these. Uh, these flares and and this is a, one of our fibers which we found after the event so yeah we, we dutch we love our orange smoke um and it kind of uh, also almost became an incident and yeah then the event's over and and i'm not sure if you guys know but at the, uh, and it's not just the f1 the f1 is what we see on tv but they also do f Three F two and and Porsche Cup, um, and uh, um, the F two and F three trucks are already on the road before the F one race is finished. They're already packed up and on the road. So um, this picture was taken two days after the event, and you can see almost everything is gone. So for us, that means we need to go in and grab our gear as quickly as we can. Because there's the power guys, and and these power cables again a lot thicker than just our tiny teeny fiber. Um, water guys, interior guys, everybody wants to get their stuff out as quickly as possible. So it is mayhem. Uh, 
uh, and and so you need to run and and try and grab your your gear as quickly as possible. So uh, Heather, I think there is a um, a poll about the tool that I used most. That might be good to uh, slide in here. Well, yeah, Raymond, I actually had a question. The uh, just interesting to see all the fiber damage. Is all of the fiber exposed like that, or do you guys put up conduit in areas where you know it's going to be? Uh... We put up conduit in area where we know, uh, but there were also areas where people said, "Well, um, there's not going to be people in there. We're going to fence this off, and then we'll just use, we'll just put it somewhere where it's easy to get back again, uh, where it's in public areas. Then um, we, um, we, we, it's in 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 culverts or other areas as well." Yeah, and a, a couple a couple interesting questions around uh, spectrum coordination um, in the Q and A. Maybe we could just head those off real quick. Yeah, Pe sure. people asking were they using Wi Fi uh, or Wi Fi sp or the unlicensed spectrum for broadcast equipment? What was the FOM doing with all those channels? Were they actually, you know, was it just for basic internet connectivity, or are they doing something interesting with the race? Uh, maybe you, maybe you can comment on that. We'll see. And but also, so the um, the communication yeah, they then... use, for example, for uh, for the cars, uh, for, from when we look at the driver's point of view, um, that is a proprietary technology. Um, let's be honest, Wi-Fi couldn't roam that fast from AP to AP to AP to AP at at uh, three hundred kilometers an hour. Um, so what they do is they use a proprietary technology, which basically sends up data up to the helicopter, which is on the track all the time. Uh, and then so that gets beamed down again and that gets, it gets handled. Um, the channels that we were not allowed to use were, um, uh, I think were used for Wi-Fi of the FOM. And um, so everything they, which is, mission critical they use licensed spectrum and, and so they wouldn't use unlicensed spectrum for those kind of operations and we also had the uh, the dutch um uh, um radio agency on on site monitoring and making sure that everybody wow. would handle and play nice in the entire rf spectrum oh well, that's useful so if somebody's Stepping on someone else's spectrum, they, the authority is right there to, to go and poke them. Very cool. All right, we got the poll question up, Raymond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, which which tool did I use most? So it's either the uh, Etherscope XNG, Ekahau, or my trusty Leatherman. All right, we got just around sixty percent of that have answer we give you a three a two one this one's close but yeah, uh, it is very it pretty well but yeah the the the, the majority wins so 42 mm -hmm. percent yeah my leatherman was my most trusted tool um <laughs> so one of the things that i had to do is uh we we got the uh the hardware from a uh, different event that riddle had done in, in munich there was the european championship athletics and um, so they were tied to a different controller so I had to unscrew all the APs, reset them, and then pair them to the new controller. So I use my, my Leatherman for that quite a bit. And also when you hang APs or tie, cut some tape and, 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 and zip ties and all that. So yeah, probably the Leatherman was the, um, um, the tool that I used most. The, the Etherscope would, would probably would be the, the runner-up. I used Akau mainly in the, in the planning uh, planning phase, uh, but yeah, the spot checks and checking every every SSID was done with the with the ether, etherscope. So yeah, great, awesome. And uh, if it's okay with you, Raymond, maybe we can spend a, a couple more minutes with Q and A. Hey, look at my slide. Perfect. Perfect timing. So a question from Anders, any strange or interesting multicast traffic you had to deal with? Nope. Um, when you look at all the um, um, all, all the iPads, we have for all, everything except the production network, 
we had a client isolation turn on. Uh, we didn't want to deal with any broadcast, make you making sure we 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 tried and 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 get as little as possible. So no, we we did not. Yeah, fair enough. Kind of a related question from uh, Scott McNeil, and thanks for being with us again, Scott. But he says, how many VLANs did you end up using uh, in general for segmenting all those different user groups? Oh, uh, do you find, and I guess, you know, kind of, do you follow the Aruba high density, one big VLAN recommendation for, for different uh, user personas? So I just opened up the, uh, the settings. And so we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 VLANs that were actively doing IP. We also had another one, two, three, four, five, and six, seven that were either spare or uh, dead VLANs or that kind of thing. Um, and all were slash 22s. Okay. So not not enormous, but pretty big. Enough. So yeah. we, uh, we didn't do Wi-Fi for the visitors. So that might be some people might say, well, hey, hang on. Only that many in slash 22. Uh, we didn't do Wi-Fi for the visitors. We did Wi-Fi for the organization, the payment. So we didn't have to deal with public Wi-Fi, which probably is a benefit as well. There's um, not enough uplink available to do public Wi-Fi. So we didn't even try. And so I imagine the cellular carriers came in with some temporary infrastructure of their own. Yep, those as well. And for some hard to reach areas, we did our own own private LTE as well. Oh, interesting. So fully licensed, no, no. Uh, in Europe, nope. there isn't a, a CBRS equivalent, right? So nope. this would have been Not a yet. fully licensed nope. solution. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, maybe one more question um, from Fang, and and probably want to keep this one high level. But uh, Fang asks, how do you determine the number of APs, coverage, and capacity? Um, so again, capacity is isn't that much clients. At, at a peak, we had two and a half thousand devices online. Again, what we're doing is we're doing payment terminals, we're doing press, and we're doing a little bit of organization. Um, and, and so it's not a high density environment. It needs to be stable. That's what we need. Um, and um, so we, we probably did an overkill of Wi-Fi because I could probably put an AP in a bar and then the bar next to it and next to it. So if it's it's a group of one, two, three bars, uh, you, you could say, well, it's just tense. So put an AP in the middle and they're covered. What we've done is we've put a bar in, in, in bar one AP and a bar three AP. So if one would fail, then at least we'd coverage. So that was more what we needed to do. We created secondary coverage for redundancy and not for roaming. Those payment terminals were stationary anyway. And so um, that's what we've done. We, we knew where the clients needed to be. Um, and, and we used ACAO as a tool to uh, to design and place the APs where we needed them to go. Yeah, fair enough. And maybe one one last question, because I, I had this question too. How many rogue uh, APs popped up, hotspots, uh, <laughs> networks from teams, who knows what, just showing up on the day of the event, right? When I uh, took the picture of Max at the uh, at the start, um, I, I looked at the, uh, the etherscope. And uh, at, at that point, which again is in the middle of nowhere, uh, but at that point, so it's not not city center. But at that point, I picked up uh, uh, seventy three SSIDs. Wow. Yeah, and uh, like you mentioned, <clears throat> it's great that you can configure the APs to not send probe responses, but the probe requests are still yep. chewing up channel utilization when all those users show up. So amazing. Amazing. Well, thanks a lot, Raymond. Uh, really interesting webinar. Uh, great to have you here on such short notice, too. And uh, Heather, I think with that, we can transition over to Eric.
Awesome. So many Ooh. great questions and, and so many more <laughs> that we couldn't get to, which I apologize for. So if you still have those questions unanswered, um, we send those to me um, tomorrow when you get your follow-ups and we'll, we'll get you some answers. But yep. Eric, welcome out of your hidey hole. How are, how are you doing? Can you breathe? I'm doing wonderfully. <laughs> so happy to be here. Awesome stuff. Love racing. So that was really fun to listen to. Boy, yeah. just all of the nuances. Really enjoyed that. Thank you, Raymond. And really I, I understand that. in Europe, looking at that racetrack, it looked like there were some right turns in the track. I don't know. It's confusing to me. <laughs> no, we have that in the, we have Grand Prix in, in the U.S. also, Jim. Yeah, yep. but it's all about NASCAR here. <laughs> Good point. Good point. I, I'm yeah. not sure. What's the, uh, the uh, inclination angle of a NASCAR turn? I don't Oof. know. It's like crazy, like 45 degrees, 50 degrees, something like that. I don't know. 50 degrees would be something like that, right? 45, so, yeah, it's insane. Um, and, and, and so here, before the long straight, there's a 90 degree banked turn. Whoa. Um, 19, no, not 90, 19. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, um, well, that's even insane for the F1. So people are like, oh, well, that's a steep turn. So. Wow. Right on. Right on. All right, guys. So here we go. Thank you, Raymond. Once again, we're going to take the last couple of minutes here to do a little bit of seven minutes with seven signal. This is where we take a look at something inside seven signal, unpack it a bit, show you how it can have some great value for you. I would be remiss if I did not mention in these few minutes that I have with you today that we have a big release coming out next week. And I'm going to take an opportunity to show you a little bit of what's so exciting about it. So I'm going to share my screen right now. And let's do a little bit of this and let's do a little bit of that. And kaboom, why don't you give me the thumbs up if you can see that. All right, so here we go, guys. As we know, Wi-Fi is, it's kind of finicky, right? It kind of comes and goes. We do the best we can to provide an awesome experience as much of the time as humanly possible. But, you know, there are things that kind of get in the way of a great experience. We know that. What we need to be able to do when we have a Wi-Fi performance management system in place, like Mobileye on devices from 7Signal, is we want to be able to just look at our locations and get an idea of, okay, am I kind of meeting my targets for good performance or not? And when I look at the screen right now for all of my different locations that I have here, it's kind of hard to know, golly, am I, am I doing a good job or not? I see an awful lot of yellow. I see a little bit of red here and there, but are all of my sites really this problematic? Or are there just a couple out of the dozen or two dozen or, or 50 or 100 sites that I have that, uh, that I need to worry about? So what 7Signal has done, and again, this is coming out next week, is we're really going all in on the 7MCS Wi-Fi experience score. All right, so the 7MCS Wi-Fi experience score is what we're using right here to measure Wi-Fi quality. What's your experience? Are you and your device achieving all that you can achieve based upon what's going on in the air, based upon the capabilities of your device? And as you can see here, 7MCS is based upon MCS. And what we're doing is we're looking for, hey, you know what, if we go to our little chart over here, we can see that if I'm able to achieve, you know, 64 qualm with an MCS of five, then I should be in decent shape. But if I dip below that and I start dipping into 16 qualm and even below, I'm, <laughs> I'm probably having a pretty poor Wi-Fi experience based upon uh, that level of stepping down, that level of downshifting that's taking place. So that's why we set four as kind of when things start to go wrong from a Wi-Fi experience standpoint. Of course, there's going to be little ups and downs in the data rate, little ups and downs in the signal strength. But again, overall, Wi-Fi protocol does a really nice job. It's pretty darn robust and does a pretty good job of you know, making sure that you've got a good connection most of the time. So here we go. With this here, the Wi-Fi quality, and again, let's go back to our Wi-Fi um, experience timeline here. We can see, wow, you know, really difficult, really hard to see where my problems are precisely so that I can drill in and do something about it. Let's go to our configuration. Let's go over to SLAs. And instead of expecting to achieve Wi-Fi experience scores or 7MCS scores above five, 
or five and above 100% of the time, let's give ourselves a little bit of breathing room, if we will. And let's say to ourselves, you know what? I realize there's going to be ups and downs throughout the course of the day. If I can't achieve my target, you know, 85% of the time, then I want to know about it. Look, you know, 10, 15% of the time, there's going to be some bad experiences here and there. Uh, and I get that. But if I can't achieve an overall good score, or if I can't, if I don't have 85%, a nice big chunk of my folks having a good experience, I need that to stand out so that I can triage and, and treat that appropriately. So let's change that to 85% threshold. I want to achieve a seven MCS or an MCS score of five and greater 85% of the time. And if there's a location of mine out there where I can't achieve that 85% of the time, I want to know about it. You know? So let's take a look at our Wi-Fi experience timeline now. Whoa, what a difference. Oh my gosh. Now, when I look at this, there isn't cause for alarm where maybe there once was because I'm filtering out all of the little onesie twosies that were taking place where maybe there was like one bad experience here and one low MCS there. Instead, now I can scroll down and I can focus in on where the real problem is, which is down here because it really sticks out like a sore thumb. Now at this Norton site, I can click into it. I can see what my SSIDs are. As you can see, the SSID, I can see the clients that are in this location. Obviously, we just have one client. Here's an instance where there's three clients. Let's take a look. Who are those three clients having a bad Wi-Fi experience? Here they are. Here they are. Oh, and as a matter of fact, those three clients are, you know, uh, the bad experience is taking place on 2.4. No big deal. Okay. Or maybe not as big a deal. So there you have it, guys. Just wanted to share with you this really nice new feature that's being introduced next week where you can set a target for good performance. And in that manner, it's really going to go a long way in helping you figure out and zero in where are the issues so that I can address those first. So there you have it. Glad to be here with you guys. And I just want to remind everybody out there that you and me, we can't see or hear Wi-Fi, but 7Signal can. Thanks for joining us, everybody. And back to you, Heather. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. Thanks, Jen. And special thanks to Raymond for joining us today. Super great session. Right. Lots of engagement. Um, and thanks to our crowd for being so much fun today. Um, you know where we'll be. Same time, same place next week. So we will see you there. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks.